on BBC News Dateline London and that's live with Gavin Esler. Hello and welcome to Dateline London. The presidents of the world's two most powerful countries, the United States and China, are to meet in an informal summit. Russian missiles for Syria and the EU relaxes the rules. Are we witnessing the slow death of European austerity policies? My guests today are Diane Wei Liang, the Chinese writer, Nezreen Malik, who's a writer on Arab affairs, Jeff McAllister, who's an American broadcaster and writer, and Adam Raphael of Transport Magazine. Very good to see you all. The new Chinese president, Xi Jinping, has been demonstrating China's interests across the world by visiting the Caribbean ahead of a summit with President Obama. Obama wants, among other things, China's help with North Korea. What does China want, and can the United States give it to them? I mean, how, how important is this uh, summit to the new leadership of China, do you think? Of course it's important. It's China going to you know, America, and it's one of the overseas trips for the new president. But it's less of a prominent visit for the new leadership than what it used to be. Um, for example, President Xi had been to Russia, to Africa for his first overseas visit, and this time he's visiting the Caribbeans and goes on to visit Obama. And it is the new China, it's the new leadership that is more confident than, say, the old leadership. And and it's also their way of demonstrating China is an emerging new power. And they want to demonstrate that they are building relationships with many countries, not just with America. I mean, it's interesting that they, they've been to the CARICOM countries, the Caribbean Economic uh, Unit, and, and that suggests, you know, we know what China's influence in Latin America, Africa, as you've said. China's global realm is, is the business of China is business, in a way. There, there is business, and there are also political issues. Uh, I suspect that there will be um, certain talks about the security arrangement in Asia, America's pivot, and their deployment of aircrafts and, and military in Asia. But by and large, um, I'm not sure what America can offer or do anything for China or help China, rather than perhaps Maybe China the other can way help around. <laughs> more of America in terms of North Korea and the trade issues, etc. And interestingly, in China, the visit of President Xi is popular, but much more interesting is what the new first lady is going to wear. Oh, really? That's yes. No, that is also a big, a big change. But just, just one thing we, we should explain, the, the America's pivot. I mean, essentially, we're talking about, Obama has suggested that uh, American interests, American forces as well, uh, concentrated on the Pacific theater. Yes, and that, and in, uh, in the earlier stage, it was in part triggered by the conflict between China and Japan over uh, the islands. And now, with the development in North Korea, uh, more and more military forces being deployed into that area. And there's a justification for that. But uh, China is very much against this movement. How, how, how do you think this is seen in Washington? Do you think it's, it's seen as a big deal, obviously? Uh, it's a big deal. Uh, I mean, these kinds of summits always, you know, get attention. But this is not a state visit. This is actually intended to be an informal visit. It was put up two months in advance of when the meeting was expected to be. I think because there have been tensions and some souring. I think, um, you know, what uh, America can do for China, it's, uh, I think, it's sort of what a, a parent can do for an 18-year-old uh, boy, which is sort of get out of the way and respect me. Um, I mean, China is uh, a, becoming a great power. I think in China, they don't actually always believe that the United States understands and respects this. There's the chip on their shoulder, and there's the sense that you've done us wrong. I don't think America ever did respect China. Well, um, see, I would say uh, that's not true any longer. I mean, it might, it might not have been true in the 19th century, and that's, it is that sense. You, you, know, you, you fed us opium. Uh, maybe the Brits did that really more than the Americans, but uh, we're going to—we're a rising power, and we demand that you respect that we do it. And we don't really believe that you're doing that, which is why I think this—the pivot to Asia, which in the context seen from Washington is, these other countries, our traditional allies, are getting very nervous because China is uh, stretching its elbows and is threatening potentially their sea lanes, their territory. It's, 
it's wanting to show that it's a great power. How do great powers do that? They, you know, they do an attack of a little island in the South China Sea or something like that. So the Americans feel this is essentially a defensive uh, a pivot in order to reassure our traditional allies that things aren't getting worse. But in this context, things could escalate. Actually, China and the U.S. have virtually nothing important to disagree about, I would say. If we, if we cannot, if this relationship can't be worked out intelligently and peacefully, it's a terrible failure, failure hope, of statesmanship yeah. on both sides. I hope that's true. I mean, the one thing they could fall out about is North Korea. The United States does need China there to make, of course, some sense, really, into what is going on in North Korea, and also as a control against any real outbreak of sort of madness which might develop in North Korea. Uh, I think to treat these two powers as equal superpowers would be absolutely wrong. If there's no doubt about it that America is still in a different league totally to China. China mm. is a country where they can't get the baby milk right and uh, it's still obviously a, a very important country and with an increasing importance over the years but it, it's still a, a, in many ways totally underdeveloped well, I mean, and so I think these re this relationship has to be managed carefully and I'm sure the pride which you know has been expressed is very important for America to acknowledge and to accept and to recognize China's place in the world. The one area is a real difference of course is over trade where the, the trade imbalances are very serious and that could result in real tension. So the two things I think are important are North Korea and trade balances. See, yes, well, I'm not entirely sure that the US has been behaving in a way that is confident and secure. There's a little bit of insecure language coming across. There's a lot of ov overcompensation. And um, the Secretary of Defense, the American Secretary of Defense uh, this morning is reported to have said that America still is, would like to establish that it has military dominance or is the superior military power in the region. A secure superpower. Which it is. Yeah, but, uh, but what I'm saying, the secure power um. wouldn't need to point that out. And so I feel that the US is just trying to remind China because there is a slight sense of threat and there's a slight sense that there is more strident. Um, confrontational language from the Chinese, which I actually find quite gratifying. It's quite interesting to see the defense, this American Defense Secretary being questioned by Chinese delegates. One stood up and said, I don't think the US seriously wants to engage with China. I think the US is using um, uh, rhetoric and talking about a comprehensive relationship, but actually just wants to contain China. And so I think that, um, that the, the US does just like to sort of establish itself as a superpower, but it is feeling threatened, doesn't understand China, wants to contain it and kind of I think that the US is good at trying to engage with belligerent confrontational superpowers like North Korea or pretentious superpowers like Iran but a non sexy superpower or pretentious superpower like China which does things by working hard um, investing in trade and um, forging relationships with third world countries is a kind of slow um, creeping power that the US doesn't really know how to engage with. It's also with. stealing all of the economic secrets it can out of American computers as well as defense secrets. It's not entirely benign on China's No, no, I'm part. not saying it's benign, I but mean, it's not doing uh, it in a very sexy way. Well, I mean, China, well, I would say China has been a really sexy topic in American uh, foreign policy for a long time. From uh, the Nixon visit on, this was the uh, very, very exciting topic. And I would actually say, uh, China's rise has been a success for American foreign policy and ought to be viewed as that. Perhaps, perhaps there is some defensiveness in Washington, but I would say in, in general, uh, this is a relationship that's going relatively well, given all the strains that are inherent in it. Dan, Dan just, just on, on, on that one point, because it is a big issue in the United States, the, the, the so-called cyber crime or, you know, uh, trace back to Chinese people, apparently. Now, how is that viewed in China? I'm sure that will be a topic that will be brought up in the summit with mm. Obama. And, and that is a serious issue and from China's point of view, government point of view, they would claim or they would state that it is out of their control. It's not state-organized state crime. Ridiculous. But in, in, I, I think there are two issues here. One is American foreign policy and they have been trying to engage with China. There is a huge group in Washington that wants to contain China. And that's a policy they seem to shift from year to year. They're not quite sure which way they're going. And, and from versa. China's point of view, China wants to demonstrate, yes, of course, we want to engage with America, but America is not the world. We want to engage with the world. It's a different kind of power. Just on, on that point, when I, I've talked to uh, 
a number of uh, representatives from African countries or leaders from African countries and, and also Latin America. And one of the things they say is there are difficulties doing business with China sometimes, but it's pretty straightforward in a way. And they don't lecture us about human rights and other things which the Americans and the British and the French and others uh, tend to do. I mean, is that is that how, how you see it? Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm from Sudan and China has a very long historical good business um, uh, relationship with Sudan. Regard so the, the, the cultural differences are huge, but when it comes to business, China knows how to deal and invest in third world countries. And America has historically been very bad at that. And I was listening to, to the news this morning, and Japan has made an aid, ple an aid pledge to third world, to African countries um, uh, for the private sector. And the way Japan, China, sort of Asian countries in general, engage with Africa, engage with countries of the South is something America could learn a lot from. But that might also be uh, allowing corruption and payoffs and not really caring too much about human rights as well. I mean, there's, you know, there, I would say the Americans certainly don't do a great job in many respects. <laughs> I but, don't, I don't but, think, I don't think know. American investment concerns are tied to human rights in Africa or in mm. the Arab world. So I think mm. that that's, that's something we can mm. dispense with. Okay, let's move on because uh, the European Union has let an arms embargo on Syria expire while the Russians have reacted by saying They'll send anti-aircraft missiles to the Assad regime. This, of course, has not pleased Israel, among others. And Israel has already shown a willingness and a capacity to bomb Syria when the Israeli government thinks necessary. Are we in danger of seeing a civil war becoming a regional conflict? Well, uh, perhaps it is already, given how Turkey and Lebanon are already being drawn into this, and also Iraq, because there are concerns there. But, I mean, how do you see this? Because in a way, it's posturing, isn't it? Because the Russian missiles are not arriving, and the European Very arms yet. are not arriving. Yeah, so R R Russian missiles are not arriving for a year. The arms embargo has uh, lapsed, but there are no weapons that are being dispatched to Syria or the Syrian rebels. What I don't understand at this point in time, the coverage over the past 48 hours has been about the threat to Israel. Kerry chastised the, the Russians and said that there is a threat to Israel if these missiles are sent. I don't see what any of this has to do with Israel. 80,000 Syrians have died over the past couple of years. You've got a fractious and um, uh, disagreeing rebel group and a dictator who doesn't hesitate to use weapons, uh, chemical weapons or weapons from, from Russia. I don't see where Israel comes into this. But and Israel I think, does. I think no, that's it, the point. No, no, it? but, it, but this, the, the, the problem with the way the U.S. engages with foreign policy in the Middle East so that it's pivoted around Israel and actually is distracted from the main concerns, which is deaths of um, Syrian citizens and civilians, human mm. rights abuses, etc. And I think, actually, that throughout the Arab Spring, America has not learned that Israel is a diversion. It's not, a, it's not a, um, a country or a situation any Arab country would like to engage with. Sure, Bashar Assad postures, uses rhetoric, says, you know, Israel is in trouble if we have missiles, but he has enough on his plate. What we need to learn about the rhetoric used by Arab dictators with regards to Israel is that it's a political tool. He has jihadis, he has Sunnis, he has anti-Israeli uh, rebels in his country. His way of maybe accommodating that is saying, I'm going to be strident with Israel. I don't think Israel you can regard Israel shooting. as a diversion. It's absolutely crucial. But I think the other crucial player, which uh, I hope the United States and indeed this country will actually go much more for, is, 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 the, uh, is Russia. Because actually that is the key to any resolution of the situation in Syria. Uh, nothing else can be done. But so we need to acknowledge Russian interests we need to forge what common ground we have with Russia. And therefore, I think this was a big mistake on behalf of uh, Britain and France to relax this embargo because Russia sees it as a threat and has responded in kind. That was absolutely the wrong thing to do. I understand why the relaxation was done. It's an absolutely a, a horrific situation in Syria, but the key to it is Russia. And without Russian assent and Russian cooperation and in Russian initiative and indeed leadership here, nothing is going to be resolved in that country. I, I, I was struck this, this week the BBC uh, began running a three-part documentary series on the road to war in Iraq. And watching that and watching those things that were happening 10 years ago and then also listening to the news reports about what a mess Iraq is in uh, now, right now, in terms of sectarian killings and so on, uh, th that must that must put a break on any thoughts of intervention, certainly from the United States' point of view, and uh, perhaps, too, from the Europeans, whatever the posturing. I think it has to. I mean, uh, how can you uh, sort of voluntarily, willingly uh, try to intervene in this conflict, not knowing how it's going to work out? It's, it's now in the province, and maybe it's too late, because uh, as happens when things start to spiral out of control, the guys 
who are the toughest minded and have the most guns start dominating. People move to the extremes. How, how can you uh, do this? I mean, I, I think in some ways it's, it reminds me of Yugoslavia uh, after uh, the fall of uh, the, most Russia. Of it, most of it. Right? Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, we will now oh, yeah. be glad to have had the dictator, as in Iraq in some ways, which is a t total mess, a yeah. chaos ensues. Um, there, is, there is no good way, I think. And uh, Barack Obama has been very clear. He wants to spend less money on war and less money trying to intervene in places that he doesn't think the U.S. can actually accomplish anything. And I don't see anybody who has a very clear idea about how supplying weapons uh, to particular groups or, uh, you know, let alone no-fly zones or things that America might be good at, like troops on the ground, well, can John, solve this problem. As you know, John McCain and some others would say yeah. this is all weakness and so on. But how do, you, how do you think that goes down with the American people? Do you think that it's, we're tired of war, we're getting out of various places, that's good? The, is, pol is the that polls that? show uh, no interest, no interest in intervening in Syria. And but because there is no interest as well. There's in no, Syria. Uh, well, there's no oil. Yeah. That, well, so yeah. there's no interest in terms of, there's no interest in intervening, but also the U.S. has no interest, has no interest in, in Syria. Well, Diane? And, uh, just um, from China's point of view, this is exactly example of the West uh, way of dealing with developing countries. China has always had a policy of non-interfering, that internal uh, affairs belong to internal affairs. China engages with Africa economically, leaving the internal affairs to the country. Here you have Syria as in you know demonst as an example where it becomes a battleground for uh, EU, for Russia, for America. In fact, it is the Syrians who have been killed in this conflict. But it was a Syrian uprising. I mean, I, I, I have to say, it was a Syrian sort of Arab Springish revolt against a really a brutal and rotten regime that got this going. Of course, in that neighborhood, there are lots of people who start to put their finger in the pie, uh, and Iran and Russia are now doing the best job of it. They're the most successful, it appears. The, the U.S., the EU, everybody else is, is sort of uh, hasn't figured out what to do. But I, I think uh, benign uh, uh, the idea that it's benign always to stay away from conflicts is not necessarily well, correct it, either. None, none of, of it benign. is benign. No, correct. Interfering Are you successful or not? Or not? Right. This not is benign. where the United Nations may really have a role to play in Syria because that is the way to get the Russia engaged. It is the way to get the United States engaged and the way to get the European Union engaged. And there really needs to be a concerted agreement among the great powers, I'm afraid. And it, that wouldn't necessarily resolve it, but at least it probably, it might, given Russian assent, secure the resignation uh, or the abdication of, of uh, the Assad regime, <laughs> just which would actually be I mean, do you a, a step towards progress. Do you have, as a step towards that, do you have any hopes for this Geneva conference whenever it's Absolutely gonna, not. Yeah, um, I, think, I think dialogue is a dead end. Um, the, the rebel groups are, there's five factions, um, and some, this, there was a very good quote one of the rebel leaders said that the Assad regime has one voice, we have five voices, um, and counting. And so I think the Geneva talks are a dead end. I think United Nations will be ineffectual. One thing people never talk about, I think there's a lot of hypocrisy in the Arab world about this, about the intervention of superpowers, etc., is how Arab countries are dealing with it and how they're intervening. Saudi Arabia, Qatar, they have not been helpful interlocutors in the Syrian, um, Syrian crisis. And I think maybe if there is a way forward in the situation, it's via powerful countries in the Gulf. Well, they're funding. They're, they're funding, funding all the funding. arms. They're funding all yeah, the, uh, the revenue. I mean, this exactly. is where the, and that's is where the, the, the know, rebels are getting there. Exactly. They're, they're, you know, ten, they're, they're ten, ten planes from Russia and, and you know, s s missiles is one thing. But in terms of what Saudi Arabia and Qatar are putting into Syria, it's, you know, it's a drop in the ocean. Okay, and well, I think people need to engage with that more Let's, let's more move on robustly. because uh, there are those, and uh, Britain's Economist, Economist magazine is one of them, who think the Eurozone crisis is far from over. In fact, Europe is sleepwalking into what could be another economic disaster. This week, the European Commission relaxed some of the rules governing when countries have to get their finances in order. So are we witnessing a relaxation of the very idea of austerity? And is Europe politically paralysed until after September's German elections? So you have a long association with The Economist. Do you agree with the, the basic premise, which is it may have gone all quiet, the stock markets might be uh, rebounding, but the Eurozone crisis is far from over? I think the Eurozone is far from over, but I certainly don't agree with The Economist. I'm glad to say its judgments. Uh, good paper though it is, are <laughs> frequently wrong. <laughs> and in this case, I think <laughs> it is disastrously wrong. When you have unemployment, of uh, over 50% amongst young people in some of the southern uh, European countries. It is a, uh, that is a disaster in the making. So the idea somehow you can pursue 
uh, safety through further austerity measures absolutely wrong. We've gone too far, far too down that route. And to my mind, it is amazing how quiescent these populations have been. But perhaps not forever. I mean, the, well, uh, perhaps the not prospect forever. of serious at public point, order uh, problems uh, uh, is, Indeed, exists. at some point the rope is going to break. You just don't know at what point it is. So it, it is, thank goodness, we've now reached a point of view which uh, understands that actually you need to start developing these, econ uh, these economies, you need to start growing these economies, and you need, of course, to have some um, inter-European banking union of or support which allows these very bad banks to, to, to be able to continue to trade through their tr troubles. Now, I, I, I'm amazed actually by The Economist in this issue because I think uh, anyone looking at Europe today can see what a terribly sick place it is. And uh, frankly, if we had 50% youth unemployment in this country, there would be total riots. The government would be out. Mm. So. It, it don't let's pursue this t po policy any further it, in Europe as it, a whole. It is interesting because, the, I mean, I, reading an American economist who was saying the people who are most in favour of uh, austerity see debt as the biggest problem. But most people, if you ask them, are more worried about unemployment, not being able to put food on the table, and whether there's going to be problems within their family just because they can't get work. And uh, is, is, that, is that how you see it? I, I, I think the European crisis is, it, it, there is a certain consensus, I'm afraid, that the bottom had been reached. The crisis is so moving away from an uh, absolute ur urgency. And I think that the austerity, it, the, the, the judgment is still out there. And I can see that uh, America has benefited from stimulus policies. So Europe is th sort of having a second thought whether austerity is gone too far. But I think the judgment is still out in the long run who will win out. And another p issue here is really, and you can't ask the German taxpayers to continue bailing out countries that have run their economy into the ground. And politically, that does but not you, but work. You, you can't ask countries uh, which have got high unemployment to be able to pay off their debts because they simply can't afford to, and they're in a vicious cycle, is, is basically the core, core of Adam's argument, isn't it? And you, it, it just doesn't work for Greece, for example. I think the problem is we don't know what works. And the economists, that you have the school of thought of stimulating growth, you have the school of thought cutting cost. And the problem is we do not know what See, I works. fundamentally disagree with you about Germany mm. because in the end, come when the push comes to shove, in the end, the Germans accept that it is in totally in their interest to keep Europe, Europe going and the uh, Commission going. And we saw that over the, uh, the, the banking intervention which stabilized the markets, and we would see it again if there was a real economic crisis. From they, I'm sure they do agree. They have showed their commitment that it is better for Germany to be in Europe and for Europe to be strong. But and w at what price would the price get to a certain point it's where they would not think no. it's worth doing it? it, it from, the, from the point of view of the Obama administration, is this is Europe going through Keynesianism for slow learners? In other words, <laughs> they, they, just, they just got it wrong. Well, I think in some ways uh, America, too, is going through Keynesianism for slow learners. I mean, that stimulus wasn't perhaps as big as, as it should have been. But you can see the results. American unemployment is at 7 percent, European at 12 percent. American debt is now at half the level it was, I mean, government debt at half the level it was even two years ago. It's still very large, but the trend line is a lot better than in Europe. Um, but the question is now how does Europe try to do the hard things, the structural reforms? I was remembering the, uh, the Lisbon Declaration of 2007 that <laughs> in, by 2010 year. <laughs> Europe was going to be the best place in the world for high mm. growth uh, economies and the information superhighway. All of those sorts of things are actually what Europe needs mm -hmm. to be doing. But now the hard part is who has the legitimacy to do the hard things like uh, labor market reform and all the kinds of things that put uh, French people out on the streets even when the president wasn't at 24 percent approval rating and European institutions themselves have less legitimacy. I, I think actually it's far simpler I th uh, than, than sort of Keynesian, Keynesian and, and cost cutting uh, um, as opposed to uh, um, spending. Um, it's about the political and the social effects of austerity and for the first time especially since Germany and France have 
kind of lost their um, sort of close relation, their dot on their, their dot on over this um, since Sarkozy um, uh, left and the Mercosi agreement then kind of fell away, is that there is an appreciation that you can't have austerity and forget about the social and the political costs of it. And so what's happened now is there's been a break. There's two years for France, given to France for it to implement its, um, its measures. And it's not so much kicking the can further down the road um, as much as it, it is maintaining the pressure and saying you're going to have to perform at a later date. And there was an excellent metaphor by a Greek economist who said, what's happening now with the breaks that have been given with austerity is that you've asked somebody to run 100 meters in 10 seconds and you've whipped them and you've lashed them and their times haven't improved. And when the race, has, the race is imminent, you say, look, I'll give you six more months. But in six months, they still have to run 100 meters in 10 seconds. So okay. this is where we are in Europe. We'll leave it there. That's it for Dateline London for this week. We're back next week at the same time. You can, of course, comment on the program on Twitter at Gavin Esler, hashtag Dateline London. Thank you for watching and goodbye.